Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and goodness in our lives. We desire to lift your name in thought, word, and deed, and we pray that you would draw all men unto yourself as we look into the books of First and Second Samuel and this very important topic on disobedience. We pray that we would not slip into condemnation or guilt or shame, but bounce out of it and uh, move into a confession and repentance and a forsaking, as we heard, of that sin and disobedience so that we can walk in obedience and in victory for the glory of God. I must die in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So everyone happy to come into the house of the Lord to begin a wonderful week. Amen. Hallelujah. It's so wonderful to see Pastor, Pastor Philip David. Let's welcome our brother. And uh, he's serving the Lord in his 70s. Amen. And uh, he's got four churches under him and a wonderful friend. God is good. Amen. And we will be working together for the glory of God. He comes all the way from Badlapur. God is good. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so it's good to have even Dr. Becky here, I guess. Yeah, with her baby. Yeah, Rohan. Hallelujah, that's nice. I think they've not seen you stand up. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Normally, we have to listen to the doctor, no? Stand up. Now. Oh, so sweet, so sweet. It's nice when everyone is sitting, we can see the baby properly. Nice, thank you. Dr. Becky, wonderful. And look at the grandparents, just smiling away there quietly. And what about the great grandparents? They are all smiles, wonderful. All four gen and the uncle, aunt, and you know, that young uncle. <laughs> Caleb? Okay, nice. We are family, amen. Good to see uh, our brother Abraham also. Uh, uh, Joshua, you are Joshua. Our pastor from uh, Dule, right? Uh, he's got three sons, uh, Pastor Butello, and this is one of his sons. The good news is that uh, brother Joshua will be in Mumbai for five months, so he's going to fellowship with us. God is good. Welcome, Joshua. God bless you. Amen. Wonderful. Well, last week uh, we were excited to hear uh, Pastor Manisha, I think for the first time, so uh, ministering the word on a Sunday morning. So how many of you enjoyed it? It was beautiful, beautiful, and uh, none other than a romantic book like Ruth. And guess who has the last word? Not a woman, but a man, and that is Pastor Rohit had the last word, and uh, it was really exciting. Well, uh, just a few thoughts of recap regarding Ruth. We see once again the obedience of Ruth. She says, your God is my God. That's the key. She told her mother-in-law, Naomi, your God will be my God. I make a choice. I'm going to follow you. Amen. Wonderful. I think on that crossroad, we had two daughters-in-law having to make a decision. Unfortunately, Oprah made a decision to forsake her mother-in-law because she couldn't have a husband there. And uh, her husband had died. Both these girls, their husbands died. Naomi's two sons and even Naomi's husband died. So they came from a place of Moab and back to Bethlehem. They had come from Bethlehem, the house of bread, into a place of real famine and ravaged totally. Now, Ruth made a decision. Your decision will determine your destiny. The choices you make in life will shape your circumstances. And Christ is Lord over every circumstance. But Christ is the Christ, the anointed one in the midst of all crisis. Now, in a crisis, make the right choice. Let Christ be your destiny. 
Let Christ be your goal. So Ruth made the wise choice. And so it was a situation coming out of widowhood and poverty into marriage and wealth and prosperity. She got a wonderful husband in Boaz, a type of Christ. And Ruth is a Gentile woman, but she has a great privilege of being an ancestor of King David and thereby an ancestor of Christ himself, the Messiah. What a lovely heritage. What a lovely uh, lineage. At the same time, Oprah made a decision. And guess what the decision or choice resulted in? Ruth was the great grandmother of David because she had Obed and Obed had Jesse and Jesse had David. But Oprah was the mother. She was the mother of Goliath. So you see the two parting ways. One brings forth Goliath. The other brings forth David. Yeah. Hallelujah. In 1 Samuel, we see the battle between Goliath and David. And David, an anointed man, slays the uncircumcised Philistine Goliath. He brings him down because this man, um, rather this giant, was challenging Israel. When you go in the anointing of God, you will bring down giants in the land. And you will slay them and you will have victory. If there is any giant that you are facing right now, believe God for an anointing to pull down the giant so that you can go and possess the land. Hallelujah. She not only produced Goliath, she produced three other giants. That was the situation of Oprah. And you couldn't hear about her any longer. But Ruth was a daughter of Zion, daughter of destiny. Hallelujah. Amen. So we see with love, you are rewarded. Amen. God is good. God is faithful. Now coming to 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, the key chapters are chapter 15 and chapter 11. Now, the theme today is disobedience. You know, if you watch uh, movies, you look at uh, thrillers and, you know, these are all real stories. Even if it is a real story, they change it a little with characters and whatever. And they make it very uh, suspense filled and all kinds of gimmicks. But I want to tell you, today when we look at these two chapters... They are not real stories in the film, but they are real facts. They are real stories. These stories are about two men. One is Saul and the other one is David. Whilst I was reading these two chapters in preparation for today, I felt these were chapters as chillers. They are chilling chapters. And when I say chillers, it's really, you know, you get, your hair goes on stand with the fear of God, with the fear of God. These are real stories. Now, when we look at chapter 15 of First Samuel, we see Saul's incomplete obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Incomplete obedience is disobedience. Amen. Amen. So don't have partial obedience. Have full obedience. Total obedience. Another area. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Now this topic of disobedience is not a very favorite topic. Because we always want an encouragement. Rather than be discouraged with all these things of disobedience. But I think the Bible is very plain, clear, straightforward. It, it is so 
powerful that it can bring forth even the flaws of men and women and yet stand strong as the truth of God's word. Hallelujah. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed, okay, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Pay attention. Hallelujah. Given to the words of the Lord. Verse 3. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. You would wonder why God is so harsh in all these things. But all of the Amalekites were contaminated, just like in Noah's time, and all had to be destroyed. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telem. Okay, that is, means little lambs. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. Okay, so Saul showed mercy for the Canaanites. Okay, and Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havila all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Verse 8, he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. He's supposed to slaughter everyone, but he kept him alive. You know who Agag is? His descendant became Haman. So that is the Antichrist spirit that came to annihilate Israel in the book of Esther. Because of this disobedience of Saul and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword, but he kept him alive. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. How many of us know we can have an evil conscience? Conscience doesn't mean good. You have to train your conscience to be good. Lest your conscience will become evil. Now according to their conscience, what were they saying? Let's keep all these good sheep, good oxen, good donkeys. Let's keep them for sacrifice. Not the donkey, but you know, the sheep for sacrifice. And we will use these good quality animals. But that was man's way of thinking. They went against the command of the Lord. When God instructs us something, we need to obey him fully. Hallelujah. Not obey him with only the nice things. So here there was a clear cut disobedience. Now verse 10. God rejects Saul as king. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. The prophet Samuel has such a burden. He's so pained. He wanted the heart of God and he felt what God felt and he wept the whole night because of Saul's disobedience. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. What pride. 
And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What audacity. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Very often when we disobey God, we want to act according to our own ways when God's ways are higher than ours. And we say, oh, it will be good for the glory of God. But God says, no, I don't want it. Amen. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, the king, speak on. No fear of God. When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission. And said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have, I mean, what audacity. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, these are the key verses. Has the Lord as great, as great as God is, can he delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, look and listen. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. But God, I'm obeying you. I've done away with all witchcraft. I've done away with all iniquity. I've done away with all idolatry. Now I am a king in your kingdom. But the Lord says, rebellion is like the spirit of witchcraft. Stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry. So well, church, we need to be careful of the area of rebellion. Rebellion is not being dependent on God, being independent of God, and even coming against God at his word. Stubbornness is putting your heels in the mud and not budging like a jackass. It is very important to know that we need to obey and obey fully and obey Instantly. Hallelujah. That is true obedience. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. What's the problem here? I feared the people. Hello, I'm talking to each one of you. Do not fear man, 
Do not fear society. Do not fear people. But fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But pastor, what will they say? What will that one say? What will this one say? In a time of crisis, do they come by you? Do they stand with you? People of God. It is God who is a present help in time of trouble. He is the one who stands with you. He is the one who walks before you and with you and in you and behind you. He's the one who lifts you. He's the one who covers you. He's the one who surrounds you. He's your provider. He's your protector. He's your peace and shalom. Hallelujah. He's your everything. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I remember as young as I was, I lost my dad at the age of 10. But in those tender years, I would always hear him and hear my brother's sister telling me, you know, and he would always say, have the fear of God. Jerry, have the fear of God. Nothing else. His message to me was only, Jerry, have the fear of God. He would least be bothered about people. He says, if you know it's going to be right, take a stand. Hallelujah. God is good. Obey God. Sometimes you may look like a fool. Ritesh led us in that worship song. I'll be mad for my king. It seems foolishness, but I will obey him. I will dance for my king. Hallelujah. Saul missed it. Bella would say. Center of obedience is the word die. And the center of die is the alphabet I. When I die, that is true obedience. Then it is Christ who lives in me. Hallelujah. Obedience, obedience. Tell your neighbor, look at them into the eye and say, please obey the Lord. Hallelujah. I fear the people and obey their voice. Whose voice will you hear? Whose voice will you obey? Will you obey the voice of the people? Or will you obey the voice of the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. The church is not a democracy. The church is a theocracy. God ruled and not people ruled. Hallelujah. Amen. The best form of Government is theocracy, which God was ruling Israel. And then they brought in monarchy. They wanted their own king, Saul. And it was a mess. God wanted to be their king. God wanted to be their God. But they rebelled. Now therefore, please pardon my sin. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. In the Old Testament, you see all these symbolic things happening in picture form. And it has deep spiritual significance. His robe tore. That meant God was rejecting Saul. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has stoned the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned yet Honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. It seemed very nice, but his heart was not right. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked 
Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Very gory, very violent, terrible. These true stories are more gory than real stories. Then Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king of Israel. Isn't it a sad story? May our stories never be sad. Tell your neighbor, may your story never be sad. When you obey the Lord, it's a good story. It's a joyful story. Hallelujah. It's not a bad story. It's a glad story. Amen. God is good. Now let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is another sad chapter. Here you see David. And when you look at David, you think of him so wonderful as a man of God, which truly is. He was a man after God's own heart. But looking at 2 Samuel as an overview, the first 10 chapters of 2 Samuel talks about the triumphs of David. Which are the triumphs of David? It was a political triumph. It was a spiritual triumph. And it was a military triumph. He had three triumphs in the first 10 chapters. But in chapter 11, it was a fulcrum. These are not the triumphs of David. These are the transgressions and the tragedies of David. One chapter talking about the transgressions of David. And then followed by chapters 12 to 24. And these are the troubles of David. So the triumphs of David, the transgression of David, and then trouble follows. Isn't it a chiller? These chapters are real chillers, but still we have to learn lessons from the Bible characters. It happened in the spring of the year, verse 1 of chapter 11, at the time when kings go out to battle. David sent Joab, he's the general, and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon. You know, in today's situation, Ammon is Ammon. That's in Jordan. And they besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It says, but David remained in Jerusalem. It was springtime, a time when all the kings go out to battle. They go out to war. But King David stayed at home. That was not the place for him to be in at that specific time. So the devil takes advantage. When you're not in the will of God, he attacks you. Verse 2, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba? Bathsheba was having a bath. Okay, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house as if Nothing had happened. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Got a problem now. Sin has brought forth its fruit. When we think about the Chief Justice of India, CJI, Chandrachud, 
the father was a wonderful man and the son too is a wonderful man but unfortunately the battle is going on between supreme court and parliament okay and the government and this is the time we need to pray like never ever before and can you imagine this son chandra chud he's saying that same sex marriage is okay if the highest authority in india is paving way for sodomy and wickedness to come into the constitution we must really wake up church because the judgment of god will come you know what else he said which doesn't come in the papers he said you look at the bible and well david and jonathan were homosexuals now he got his information from these books that people write which are full of lies and wickedness and with an antichrist and anti god spirit david and jonathan were not homosexuals it says david kissed jonathan when they were parting they were real good covenanted friends they kissed each other and they said bye but that was a clean holy kiss hallelujah like christians are told to do it greet one another with a holy kiss but if it was something deeper then the bible would not shy away from it it would have said david knew jonathan that is a sexual relationship or like we hear this david lay with jonathan in bed that is real homosexuality come on now we have to arise and pray against this demon spirits that are let loose and let's get into serious prayer and fasting these 40 days which we are declaring from tuesday right up to that last on saturday on the eve of easter that is resurrection sunday believe god for a breakthrough in your lives individually family church stream body of christ city state nation it's a bad shape what's going on a clean hijack of even political parties and all these things pray for me i'm going to be speaking at the mayor hall on wednesday and the rss and bjp top officials are coming for that meeting so please keep it in prayer on wednesday evening 6:30 to about 9 o'clock yes we are going to reach out it says be close to your friends but be closer to your enemies we have to build bridges our poor pastors are being beaten up left right and center in north india and all other places it's time to move hallelujah and touch these men who are responsible hallelujah amen you'll be surprised how many of them are going to embrace the lord in this end time it's going to be believe god i would expect all of us to clap our hands unto the lord thank you praise the lord verse 6 it's full of emotion this chapter uriah does not sleep with bathsheba then david sent to joab saying send me uriah the hittite and joab sent uriah to david when uriah had come to him david asked how joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered and david said to uriah go down to your house and wash your feet the conniving that david did is unbelievable so uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him you understanding this i'm reading the actual word of god sometimes it's good to read the word hallelujah rather than making it paraphrased but uriah but uriah but 
David, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. What a faithful man this is. Uriah, David sinned against God. He sinned against this man, Uriah. And he's covering up a sin. He wanted Uriah to go to bed with his wife so that the pregnancy is covered up and it looks as if it is Uriah's child. You saw that wickedness? Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next now when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. David made Uriah drunk. He's not given up. He wants this guy to go into his house and be with his wife. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. You saw this whole drama? It's chilling. Now David commands Uriah's murder. To cover one sin, you have to commit another sin. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. What a strategy, what a plot to kill this man now. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. Let's fast forward to verse 26 and 27. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Bathsheba truly loved her husband, but she was forced into this adulterous relationship by none other than the king who had all authority, that is, our very own David. Verse 27. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Our disobedience will displease the Lord. Our obedience to him will please him. Very sad. Now you look at Saul. He ended badly. In the battlefield, he committed suicide. He killed himself. David, when confronted by prophet Nathan, he immediately did not justify his sin of adultery, plotting and murder. But immediately he says, I've sinned. He repented genuinely of his sin by writing Psalm 51. No matter what wickedness one may do, whilst you are living, you need genuine repentance. And once you repent and forsake the sin, you are going to be blessed. As far as the east is from the west, he will take away our transgressions. He will choose not to remember your sin any longer. He's God. He can, he can never forget. But he chooses not to remember your sin. Though your sin be a scarlet, he will make you whiter than snow. Hallelujah. No guilt, no shame, 
pure justification in Christ. Just as if I've never ever sinned. Now if we get judgmental on whether it be Saul or even David. And we say, hey, sh -sh 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 -sh. this is terrible, terrible, terrible. We can be like big hypocrites. Oh, murder, adultery, crazy, plotting to kill your faithful man. How can this be? I want to tell you, none of us present in this hall or auditorium is innocent. None of us is ever innocent. I would ask anyone who's innocent to raise their hand. None of us. You know why? Jesus steps in bringing in the grace and truth, but the new covenant. He says, the law of Moses says, if you commit adultery, yeah, it is sin. Mind you, there's no mortal sin, venial sin like the Catholic Church professes. Sin is sin. An iota of sin is the same as a big blot of sin, right? With that iota of sin, you can go to hell. But when Jesus came, hallelujah, he says, but I say, even if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed the act. Huh? So what's happening? It's so serious. The law of grace is higher than the law of Moses. It's the thought life. Oh, murder. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, you have already murdered him. Church, let's stand. Father, we thank you for your holy word, which is a mirror. We see the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And we see the imperfect eye. And Lord, as we look into your word, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing the spirit of conviction, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We pray, Lord God, that you would convict us every time we have failed thee, so that we would be prompt enough to repent and forsake sin, never slip into habitual sin, and never into any kind of addiction. Help us, Lord. Deliver us and heal us. Forgive us. Cleanse us by your blood. Right now, Holy Spirit, may your anointing break every yoke over our lives. We come to you in total justification in Christ. Hallelujah. Delivered from the penalty of sin. We come asking you to sanctify us in the present, that we may be delivered from the power of sin. And we thank you, Lord, for the future in glorification, we will be totally delivered from the very presence of sin. Lord God, have mercy on us. You know of the times we have failed you. Sins of omission, sins of commission. Things we've done which we were not supposed to do. Things we've not done which we were supposed to do. Help us, Lord. Church, lift up your hands to the Lord and say, Here am I, Lord. I want to love you and serve you all the days of my life. In total obedience, in implicit obedience, in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people shout, Amen. Amen. Give a high five to one another. Amen. God is a good God. Let's give him glory.